What is up, everybody? This is Mike with Tiny Life Big Mission, and this week in the Word, we are studying the doctrine of the Trinity. Grab your word of truth, and let's jump in. Welcome back to This Week in the Word, where this segment of the channel focuses on a weekly Bible study where we share truth based on what the Word of God says. If you have questions about God or you are seeking truth, we want to welcome you. I thank you all for joining, and I hope that this video is a good resource for your personal studies. We are continuing our investigative study on doctrine in a series called Bad Religion, the Doctrine Behind Christian Denominations. This week's study, we are covering the topic of the Godhead, or the Trinity. Now, just as a reminder, this video, along with others like it, have been grouped into a playlist called Bad Religion, which can be found under the Playlist tab on our channel's main page. If you're new to this channel or are interested in understanding more about our position, please check out our quick reference video on our five guiding principles. I will link that video on the top of the screen here. As a starting point for this series, we are covering the foundational doctrines of the Christian religion. These foundational doctrines are the core beliefs that make up the religion of Christianity. They are what I call the close-handed doctrines. They are not open for negotiation or for disagreement. If you are a Christian, then you believe them, and if you don't believe them, then you're not a Christian. Now, I know that these doctrines are not new to you, and I know that they are mainly milk and not meat, but how many of you are able to defend these basic foundations of doctrine? If someone came to your house and knocked on your door, and they had a Bible, and they said that they were a Christian, and they said that Jesus wasn't God, how would you respond? Would you shut your door on them, just dismissing them as being an error? Would you argue with them? Or would you invite them in and show them in a loving way from the scriptures that Jesus is indeed God? Do you know where to turn for those verses? Do you have notes in your Bible to help you or remind you or aid you in, the, in going from verse to verse and from topic to topic? These basic doctrines are well known by Christians but are not well defended from the scripture by most Christians today. So I hope that even though you know these basics of our faith, that you will take time to go through this study and brush up on these basics and make notes in your Bible. Additionally, most of my channel is pretty deep in doctrine, and these close-handed doctrines are helpful for new believers who are trying to get grounded in the truth of religion and looking for a place to start. They don't have to jump into the deep end of the pool, so to speak. So as we go through this series, we will be covering the Christian denominations, looking at what they each believe and why. So before we jump into that, we're going to do a pre-series covering the close-handed doctrine so we have a baseline of comparison. As we've gone through this series, we can see how each doctrine builds on the other, and today's study is no different. In fact, the doctrine of the Trinity is closely connected to the deity of Christ. Christians are monotheistic, which means that we worship one God. We believe that God the Father is God, yet because the Bible tells us that Jesus is God, we, we follow him and worship him. This is what makes us Christians. We follow Christ. But how can God the Father and Jesus both be God? That's a good question. And as you study the Bible, you will find that the Bible also calls the Holy Ghost God as well. What the Bible teaches about these three distinct persons uniting as one God is what we call the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, I understand on the surface level that this seems like there might be a contradiction or that it's kind of hard to comprehend. The reason that we believe this doctrine is because we believe what God's Word says. Now, there are those who have placed themselves in the camp of Christianity who call themselves Christians but do not believe in the Trinity. Some of the main arguments that they will rise against this doctrine are that the Catholics came up with this doctrine. This is a Catholic doctrine. Now, I understand that the Catholics believe and follow some doctrines that are not biblical, but that doesn't mean that everything that they believe is then false. They believe in the virgin birth. That's true doctrine. They believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's true doctrine. They also believe in the Trinity, and that's true doctrine. But the Catholics didn't make up this doctrine. This doctrine is found in Scripture, and we are going to cover that in our study today. Now, the next common argument that is brought against the doctrine of the Trinity actually has to do with the word Trinity. Uh, they'll argue that it's not even a biblical word. And that is a fact. The word Trinity is not used in the Bible one time. The word Trinity is a word that we use to identify a concept that is taught in the Bible, just like the word rapture. 
Really, when you think about it, this argument is kind of silly. Did you know that the words sovereign, omniscient, and omnipresent are not in the Bible? Yet Christians will tell you that these words are attributes of God. So how do we know that if they're not in the Bible? If people really want to get nitpicky about it, the word Bible is not in the Bible. So does that mean that we don't have to submit to the Bible? I mean, really, honestly, where does this logic end? For those who need to have a Bible word that describes the Trinity, the word is Godhead. It's in the Bible, and we will cover that in this study. The last common argument that is raised against the doctrine of the Trinity is based on things that Jesus said in the Bible. For example, Jesus uh, praying said that God is the only true God in John 17, 3. In John 14, 28, he said that my father is greater than I. And then in Mark 13, 32, Jesus says that only the father knows when the last day is. Man doesn't know and the angels don't know, neither does the son meaning that he himself, Jesus, didn't know. So you can see how the, the deity of Christ and the Trinity are closely connected, and there's honestly an answer for each one of those verses. It all comes back to the context. That's why the context is so important. Each of these verses are true, yet Jesus is God, and there's not one contradiction. Now, Covering each of these arguments against this doctrine is not the point of this study, but we will address them in this series as they are all verses that are used to support some different denominational doctrines that we'll see as we look at the religion of Christianity. The purpose of this study is to demonstrate from Scripture the doctrine of the Trinity. It's only through this doctrine that we as believers know that Jesus is God and the Father is God, and that is why we follow Jesus Christ as Christians. It's because we understand that he is part of the Godhead. He is God. Understanding the connection of the Godhead between the, the three counterparts is what gives us the foundation for our belief in Jesus as God. It's a hill that all Christians need to die on. Christians are monotheistic, which means one God. Mono is one, theistic means God, so monotheistic, one God, which is the flip side of polytheistic or uh, many gods. Christians don't believe in many gods. This concept is deep and there's some questions to it, but it's what the Bible says. And to defend it accurately or, or to defend it well, you need to understand what that actually means. The word Trinity was created in the English language for this very concept. It's not a biblical word, but rather a word that was given in our language to name a biblical concept. If you look it up in the dictionary, it will literally say something to the effect of the Christian view of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit being united as one God. Our God is one God in three persons. Now, the key to understanding this concept is comprehending the difference between the words being and person. Being is the quality or the state of having existence. It's what you are. A person is the quality that distinguishes you. It's who you are. God is one being. He is God. But God is not one person. He's actually three persons. God's persons are distinct. They are not modes or personalities or moods or anything like that. They, that is why we call him the triune God. Tri meaning three, yun meaning united as one. What God is, is God. Just God. That is his being. But who God is, the person of God, is Father and Son and Spirit. Now, in comparing that to us, it makes more sense. As his creation, we are one being. We are human being. And we have one person. What I am is human. Who I am is Mike. There's just one of each. Comprehending this helps explain why when the Bible says that Jesus said that his father is greater than he, that he is not lying, nor is he saying that he's not God. 
the person of the Father is greater than the person of the Son, but both the Son and the Father are God. The God of the Bible is one God, but he reveals himself to us in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Each are equally God, but separate or distinct from the other, yet the three of them are united as one. This is what the scriptures teach, and it's what I'm going to demonstrate in this study. And all of this is built on last week's study, which proves that Jesus is God. Now, the verses that I'm covering today are not exhaustive. There are many more, but for the sake of time, I'm going to cover what I can at a quick and high-leveled pace. So grab your Bible and whatever you want to use to take notes. Now, as we go through here, I will have the verses that we will be covering next on the screen before we get there. You can see below where I have it listed here. So you can turn there uh, ahead of time so that when it comes time to read, you're ready. Also, feel free to pause if you want as we go, uh, either to find the scripture or to make notes. But let's jump in and see what the scriptures say. Turn to Deuteronomy 6.4 if you haven't done so already, and we will see what the Bible clearly tells us in that there is only one God. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That capital L-O-R-D means Jehovah God, the Most High God. Verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. I also added Isaiah 43, 10 in here as a second witness, which says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. There is only one God, and he is our Lord. He is who we serve. We as Christians serve, worship, reverence, that one God and Savior. Now, the Bible tells us that we can understand this concept of the Trinity through creation, through how God created the earth. Uh, we find this verse in Romans 1.20, which says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. This verse says that his Godhead is understood by man from the creation of the world. Now, when you think about this, there are tons of three-in-ones that we see in creation. Uh, a quick few examples is like an egg. An egg has a shell, a white, and a yolk, yet it's one egg. When you ask somebody to prepare you an egg, you don't say, can you crack a shell and fry the white and the yolk for me? You just say, can you make me an egg? It's because of its one thing, even though it's made up of three parts. Uh, solar rays are like this. There's a visible solar ray, a ultraviolet, and an infrared. There's three different types of ray that all make up the, the sun that we see. Water is no different. Water can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas. It's all water, regardless of what it, what it is, but it can come in three different forms. God is no different. This is an echo of him in his creation. Okay, so I think I've covered the point that our God is one God, but exists in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But where do we get this from as Christians? It comes from the Bible, believe it or not. The Bible gives us these names of each person of God and even calls them each God independently. First, we're going to look at the Father. Now, the Father doesn't usually get a ton of pushback. There are a lot of different religions outside of Christianity that worship the Father God as their God. Uh, they don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in the Holy Ghost. But I don't think that there's a ton of people that would say that God the Father isn't God. Even Jews think that God the Father is God. So I'm not going to dive super deep here. Uh, there are tons of verses that speak about God the Father as being God, but for time's sake, I'll just give us one just to prove it from the Bible, and that is 2 Peter 1.17, which says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory, this is speaking about Jesus, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 
And yes, I did choose this verse because it does show a picture of the sun and how there is a connection there between God and the sun, and they both have deity. Next, we see that the sun is God. Again, the Bible is very clear that Jesus is God. This is what all of last week's study was about, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time proving this either. If you want more, uh, you can catch uh, what we did last week uh, on the channel, but I will give you two witnesses more than what I covered last week uh, that prove that Jesus is God. The first reference is found in Titus 2.13, the second in Hebrews 1.8. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's saying that Jesus Christ is the great God and our Savior. Those two titles are attached to him in this verse. And if he's the great God, then that either puts him over the Father as God, or it makes him equal to the Father with God. And that ties into what we talked about last week. Hebrews 1.8 says, But unto the Son he saith... The he saith is God saying. So God is speaking here. You can get that uh, reference from verse 1-1, one, one, where it says, At sundry times and diverse manners God spake. And I was quoting that off my memory. I don't have it in front of me. but uh, So if I got it wrong, don't hold it against me. But God is speaking here in context. This is God speaking. And he says, But unto the Son, thy throne, O God. So God the Father who's speaking is calling the Son, O God, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. That means he's everlasting. He's eternal. That's, that's the God that we serve. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. The Bible's pretty clear about Jesus being God. It says it over and over again. And it even says that the Spirit of God is God as well. And that's what we're going to look at last in this section. Now, there are many more verses that say this, but just to give you two witnesses for time's sake, let's look at Acts 5, verse 3 and 4, as well as Matthew 12, verse 31. Acts 5 says, But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? So that's who Ananias is lying to, is the Holy Ghost. And to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So who he lied to was the Holy Ghost, and who that person who he lied to was, was God. Matthew twelve thirty one is Jesus speaking, and he says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, if you understand the word blasphemy, it is tied to deity. It's tied to God. Only God can be blasphemed. So if this verse says that you can blaspheme the Holy Ghost, it clearly is saying that the Holy Ghost is God. If he can be blasphemed, he's God. Again, there are many more verses that prove this. Now, some will push back on the Holy Ghost being God, and they will say that he's not God. They will say that he is an energy or a force or some kind of attribute or personality of God, but not God. And that is simply not true, um, at least not according to what the Bible says. The Holy Ghost is a person, and that's normally where the attack against the Holy Ghost comes, is to attack his personhood, if you will. They say that he's not a person, therefore he can't be a god. Um, but the Holy Ghost clearly is a person. We can see this in Scripture. I'll show you in Acts 10:19, uh, where it says, While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit saith unto him. So the Spirit spoke. It's speaking energy can't speak. Uh, a personality can't speak on its own. The spirit spoke here, so it declares it as being its own distinct thing. Look at what it says. Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing. For I... The Spirit called itself I. I is a pronoun of identification. It's saying that it is a singular individual, a person. For I have sent them. Acts 13.2 says, As they ministered to the Lord, they fasted. And the Holy Ghost said, Separate me. There you see the identification of a person right there. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I 
that identification again, I have called them to. Now there's further scripture that proves that the Holy Ghost is indeed a person. We're just not going to take the time to go through it. But just to give you some examples um, of the person, the personal attributes of the Holy Ghost, the things that make him a distinct person, not just some energy. Uh, you can see in, in scripture that the Holy Ghost can be grieved. It says this in the Old Testament as well as the New. It talks about it in Isaiah as well as Ephesians 4.30. Uh, in John, the book of John, it says in chapter 16.13 that the Holy Ghost will guide people and speak to them. We also saw that in Acts. Uh, in John 15.26, it says that the, the Holy Ghost will testify. He testifies. Uh, he, he testifies of the truth. So the Holy Ghost is not an energy. He's an actual person. He has personal attributes and he's part of the Trinity. He's God. I'm sure most of you have already seen a chart at some point in time like this, but once you understand the concept of the Trinity, it's better to then look at something like this as opposed to looking at something like this first and then trying to comprehend, I feel anyways, because I think that when you get it in your head, it makes logical sense. The illustration enhances that understanding versus seeing the illustration first and trying to make all the pieces of the puzzle fit into the illustration because the illustration isn't the word of God. The illustration helps the word of God, if that makes sense. But you can see in the center here is God. And you can see the Father is God. The Holy Ghost is God. The Son is God. They are all three in one God. But the Son is not the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is not the Father. And the Father is not the Son. They are three distinct individual persons that coexist, that are unified in one God. Now, I understand that there are scriptures that can be lifted and taken out of context or twisted to make it seem like Jesus wasn't God or that the Holy Ghost is not God, but it's not enough to find a verse that supports what you want the Bible to say. You also must make sure that the Bible doesn't speak against what you want it to say as well. So what do you do with all the scriptures that clearly state that Jesus is God or speak of the Trinity? You have to change them or throw them out in order to make your doctrine say what you want it to say if you don't believe the Trinity. Now, what you will find as we get further into this study is that all, and I mean all, of the religions that go against the Trinity have had to create their own Bible to support the doctrine that they want to believe. This is because the Bible is clear on the doctrine of the Trinity. The truth is, is that the concept of the Trinity is biblical. There are so many examples all over scripture that show us this truth. And to do this topic justice would actually take probably several hours to dive through all of it. And I don't have several hours. In fact, I'm trying to cover all this info in 30 minutes or less. And most likely I'm probably going to go a little bit over. Um, so for the rest of the time that we have, I'm going to focus on a couple key points and places in scripture that make this doctrine irrefutable if words have any meaning. The first four points that I want to cover with our remaining time is that the biblical term for the Trinity is Godhead. This term is given in the scripture by God's inspiration three times. Think about that for a second. This term for presenting the triune God is recorded three times. Those references are Acts 17.29, Romans 1.20, which we read already, and Colossians 2.9, which we will read now. For with him, speaking about Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So this verse clearly shows us that there is a Godhead. It's a multiple part God. And the fullness of it dwells in the body form of Jesus. Point number two is that there are plural first person pronouns used by God in the Bible. Now, singular first person pronouns would be things like me, I, my, plural first person pronouns would be we are us those kind of things this is where the word of god gets so cool and proves that there is no way that this book was written by mere men first we're going to reference titus 1 verse 1 and 2 paul a servant of god and an apostle of jesus christ according to the faith of god's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness in hope of eternal life 
which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Well, who this eternal hope of life was promised to couldn't have been humans because of it was promised, the promise was made before the world began. So who did God promise this to? He promised it to his son. God the Father promised the son to be the hope of the eternal life before the world ever began. And you may say, meh, that's not really what that says. You're reading a little bit too far into it. And that's okay. Think what you want. These other ones are irrefutable. Let's turn next to Genesis 1 and we'll look at verse 26. This is back in the very beginning of the Bible where God is creating man. And God said, that's that's what the Bible says, and God said, we know who's talking, let us, God said, let us. Now he's not talking about the angels. The angels didn't help God make man. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are what made man. And they said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man. There you see it. Singular. God created man. It wasn't God in the angels. It wasn't God in other entities. God created man in his own image. So the very next verse says it singularly, where in verse 26, it says it plural. That's how you can tell that God is a trinity. He's, there's multiple persons to the one God. The Bible always tells the truth. In Genesis 11, the account of the Tower of Babel is recorded. And we see in verse 6 where it says, And the Lord said, that's who's talking, capital L-O-R-D again, that's Jehovah God, the mighty God, said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us, the Godhead, the three in one, go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Later on in the book of Acts, you see uh, in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit confound language there. That's God confining language, just like he confound language here. And it also shows that the Holy Spirit is indeed God because he's the one who confines language because he's the one who created language. Next, we look back at Isaiah 6.3, and this is a verse that we talked about last week, and we're kind of picking up where we left off with that. In verse 3, it says, And one cried unto another, that's talking about the seraphim, and said, Holy, capital H, that's interesting, holy, holy, is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This, again, is a picture of the Trinity. You see holy, holy, holy. There's three times that holy is said. One holy for the Father, one holy for the Son, and one holy for the Holy Ghost. And I understand where some may scoff at that and say, well, that's not what that's saying. That's just a coincidence, and you're making a connection that doesn't really there. It's just you reading into it. And that's great. Suit yourself. But what we study here next is irrefutable and quite simply amazing. In verse 8, we see the commissioning of Isaiah, where uh, the Lord asks him, who will I send? And Isaiah steps up and says, send me. And then God gives him something to take to the people of Israel, a part of prophecy. And this is all from the Lord, the God in heaven, God the Father. So let's pick up in verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Us. (laughs) Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? You see the plurality there. So those holy, 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 that's not a coincidence. That's what it's saying in the context of this verse. It's showing that there is a trinity here present. And we'll keep reading. Then said I, that's Isaiah speaking, Here am I, send me. And he said that he is the one, the Lord, who is sending Isaiah. And what he says is, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Now this is cool. In Jesus' earthly ministry, we see in Matthew 13, where Jesus speaks these same words to the people. 
In verse 13, it says, Therefore speak I, that's Jesus talking, to them in parables, because they seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. And notice that Jesus says that it is him that should heal them and I should heal them. Jesus is speaking this to the people after the Father spoke it to the people. And if that isn't crazy enough, we also see the Holy Ghost say the same thing in Acts 28. Verse 25 is where we pick up. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. What did Paul tell them? Well spake the Holy Ghost. (laughs) So this is showing that the Holy Ghost is God but it's connecting the Trinity through this prophecy where they said, holy, 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 three different times, one for each. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them." The Holy Ghost said that he would heal them. So the Father said that he would heal them. The Son said that he would heal them. And the Holy Ghost said that he would heal them. Boom. Trinity. Beautiful. I love the Word of God. It's so cool. Now, I know that there are scoffers out there who would say, well, what you've done is you've connected things, and that's not really a clear presentation of the Trinity in the Bible. The Bible really doesn't have a clear presentation of the Trinity. And if so, why don't you just show us where it's clearly presented? Well, there is a clear presentation in the Bible of the Trinity. There's several. Um, the, The two that I think are the most clear are the two that I've pulled out here, and I forgot to put the reference down there. It's 1 John 5, 7 and Matthew 28 19 we'll look at Matthew first in Matthew 28 19 we see the Great Commission as it's called of Jesus where he's commissioning the 11 disciples to go and continue the work of the kingdom that that Jesus had started and he tells them go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name the name not the names plural the name singular there's one name But what is that name? The name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's the picture of the Trinity. They're all one. That's the name. They're they're one being in three persons. The next verse is 1 John 5, 7. And this one is so crystal clear that all versions of the Bible uh, past the, the 1611 have mucked it up in some way, shape, or form, or just completely omitted it. They've removed it from the Bible. Uh, That's how they have to get rid of it in order to do away with this teaching because it's so clear. It says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. They're one God. Now, the last example that we're going to look at today is Christ's first advent on the world. Now, Christ will have multiple interactions with the world. The first one has already happened. There's a second one coming. And in between those two, he's not going to come back to the earth, but he will come to the clouds and call us up to meet him in the air, according to what the Bible says in Corinthians and in Thessalonians. And that's all open-handed doctrine. We're not debating that. We're not even discussing it today. But In the first advent of Christ on the earth, we see a connection with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They're all three present throughout his entire ministry. We see the three of them present at the birth of Christ, at the beginning of his earthly ministry, and at the resurrection when when God raised him up. Uh, we'll start first with uh, the birth of Christ, which we look at in Luke 1, 35, which says, The angel answered and said unto her, that's Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest, that's God the Father, shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. 
right there in one verse you have all three and it's at the beginning of when the messiah was that was promised is coming to the earth for his first advent the holy ghost the highest and the son next we'll look at the beginning of christ's ministry christ's ministry started when john the baptist baptized him in the jordan we see this account in matthew 3 verse 16 which says and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Ghost, descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven, that's the voice of God the Father, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The verse that I demonstrated at the very beginning of this video in Second Peter chapter 1 was an account of this very thing that says God the Father said those things. So I did that on purpose to where you could see that this voice from heaven was God the Father's voice. So God the Father's present, God the Spirit is present, and God the Son is present. The resurrection of Christ is present all throughout the Bible. It speaks about it all throughout the whole New Testament. And in the resurrection, not only were there three persons present of the Godhead, but the scripture reveals how all three were individually involved and responsible for it as God. We'll start with Acts 4.10. This is an example that we see if God the Father is who is responsible and identified as God in raising Christ from the dead. It says, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, that's God the Father, even by him doeth this man stand here before you whole. So we see clearly that God the Father is who raised Jesus. Now Jesus the Son also testified about raising himself. John 2.19 says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it up. Later on in the book of John, he also tells the Jews that I have the power to lay my life down, no man taketh it from me, and I have the power to raise it up again. Jesus raised himself up from the dead. He is God and he has that power. Then in Romans 8, we see the Holy Spirit is who raised Jesus from the dead, where it says in verse 11, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. So God the Father raised him, Jesus raised him, and the Spirit raised him. That to me is just another cool reference that shows the trinity of the Godhead. And there are many, many more verses that I could use that would cover this, but we're, we're at that time where we've got to kind of shut it down. Uh, I hope that this video was helpful. I know we went fast and we went at a high level. Uh, take time to go back and look at it if you need to. I also recommend making chains in your Bible. Uh, you can just, in the front part of your Bible, write something where you write a, a comment of what the topic is and give a verse. And then when you flip to that verse in the Bible, you put a little note going to the next verse so that you can do a chain where you go from verse to verse to verse to verse that all support a specific doctrine. Or in that very front section or on a blank page inside your Bible, you can just write out all the verses in a row that contain the the scripture for that doctrine either way uh, it's definitely something that is good to be brushed up on i know that as i did this study it's stuff i've known for years but it gets me excited i love learning these basics again and brushing up on these basics again so i hope that they're a blessing for you uh, ever bit as much as they were for me and even though the word trinity doesn't ever appear in the bible it is a doctrine that is clearly taught in the bible and without that doctrine, the Bible is full of contradiction and doesn't make any sense. But with that doctrine, it gives us a hope that we can believe in through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's going to conclude this week's study. But before you go, if you want to know how you can support the work that we do here, there are four easy ways. First is that you can share our studies with those who you know who need the Word of God. You can also share them on all your social media platforms. Second is to like this video if you found the content helpful. And third is to subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already. These three actions support the algorithm inside of YouTube to help the Word to go 
out. But most importantly, the biggest way that you can support this ministry is through prayer. James 5.16 says that the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. People need truth and your prayers can help, so please pray for this mission. If you have questions or would like to share your story, the best way to communicate with me is by email, which is tinylifebigmission at gmail.com. I simply ask that you remember our five guiding principles before reaching out. And that's all the time that we have for this week. I hope to see you next week in this word. Okay, bye. Okay, bye.